Good evening, everyone. Thanks for making it here. Uh, welcome to Slow and Steady, talking about sea turtle conservation in India. This is our 12th edition of Public Texts at IHS. Uh, Public Texts is a series of with authors. Uh, it's hosted by the IHS library, which is a public reference library. Please do check it out. It's on the third floor here. There are flyers available at the registration desk for details about uh, membership and so on. Um, you can feel free to come in and browse on any day of the week between Monday and Saturday. Um, it's also open from 9 to 6. Uh, today we have Karthik Shankar with us. He's in conversation with H.S. Sudhira. Allow me to welcome them. As faculty at the Center for Ecological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, he now indulges his fascination for ecology and evolution, working with students on frogs, reptiles, birds, plants, reef fish, and other marine fauna. He was inspired to a career in ecology by an ancient reptile, a sea turtle that crawled ashore late one night in Madras. His work has resulted in the book, From Soup to Superstar, The Story of Sea Turtle Conservation Along the Indian Coast. The books are also available, the, available at the back. Please do check them out, buy some of them. Um, our moderator for this session, H.S. Sudhira, obtained his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, for his thesis titled, Studies on Urban Sprawl and Spatial Planning Support System for Bangalore, India. With a strong desire to carry out independent and grounded research, he has established Gubbi Labs, a private research collective. He is also a bird watcher and volunteers with the India Literacy Project. Welcome and take it over. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, in case uh, my volume comes down, please. Uh, part of our work, we have been into it, and I see that, like having read this book, now I see that you cut across the science of like looking at the biology of sea turtles, and but it doesn't, it does not, just like your plus two bio or some undergrad biological book, uh, you know, biosciences book, but it also touches upon the lives and the journey, and most importantly, it has the connect that in the journey they have made with the host of people and institutions. And of course, it also talks about some of the politics behind it and, and the challenges that it has come in. I'm glad he's, he's been able to articulate them and all of it. And so, so to start with, I will sort of, uh, you know, start with one of the key things that was a discovery for me was, was this person called Satish Bhaskar. Karthik, would you start with talking about Satish? Oh, can you hear me? Is this working? All right. Yes. yes. All right. Okay. Cool. Um, <clears throat> you're going to have to cut me off because I can actually talk about Satish for the entire hour. Um, yes, I realize that because the entire book is about Satish and Ram. Yes. Um, so when I was uh, in um, in college in in Madras, and the fact that I call it Madras gives away my antiquity. Um, uh, to be fair, that, that was what it was known at the time. Uh, I was a student of zoology in uh, Madras Christian College, and uh, I heard, you know, of course, we were doing the usual things that students in college do, which is basically not attending class. I mean, we'd sit in the gutter and have coffee, and, you know, we'd, you know, sports or cultural events or whatever, and none of us, I mean, very few of us were actually interested in what was going on inside class. And I heard, I heard that some of my seniors were, were going to go on something called a turtle walk. Right, and you hear the words "turtle walk" out of context, and all kinds of things run through your head. Uh, the last of which that is that it has anything to do with actual turtles at all, because in the 80s nobody in, in Madras actually knew that that sea turtles actually came to those uh, you know to those shores to nest. Uh, I quickly discovered, of course, that you know that that uh, about the species called the olive ridley, and that it nested along the entire east coast, and uh, you know that. Uh, there were these student groups that would go out to conserve them and there was this person who was a mentor to these students and that was Satish Bhaskar, a very unassuming guy and uh, I subsequently learned that he had dropped out of uh, IIT Madras in the 1970s and uh, become involved in sea turtle uh, surveys uh, through his associ association with Ra Romulus Whitaker. 
by the mid 80s satish had already done several incredible things uh, in the 1970s uh, in 79 uh, he decided to survey this one island in the lakshadweep called uh, suheli which is uh, an island that i visited in 2015 that you can walk around in about an hour or so or less and uh, it takes about 6 hours by boat from the nearest other inhabited island uh, by fishing boat which you have to organize and he wanted to stay there during the monsoons when a particular species of sea turtle nested uh, <coughs> but that was not when the fishing boats went there so he and his team arranged for him to be dropped off in may by a fishing boat and picked up in september uh in 1979 uh i can tell you it took a fair amount of effort for us to arrange logistics in 2015 so 35 36 years before this man asked them to drop him off there for four months with all of his supplies he had rice and sugar and like dal and all of that and he lived for four months on that island on his own um uh, and the two remarkable things uh you know how when like the ubers like five minutes late we get upset you know or ten, something's 10 minutes late we're like oh my god it's late right the boat that was supposed to pick him up was one month late and he just carried on uh well he actually didn't have a choice but fortunately he had enough food and supplies and so on so the boat came a month late and he packed up and he left and he came back and provided the first sort of like surveys of green turtle nesting for that island but it wasn't that no one had heard from him uh of course 1979 no sat phones or anything like that every day he picked up he found some he found these you know bottles on the beach and he wrote a note for his wife and he stick it in the bottle and seal it and toss it out into the ocean uh, and it kept washing ashore because it's a big lagoon and so he'd wade out into the lagoon and try and toss it beyond the reef and then he tied floats to it uh, anyway one of these went beyond and uh, floated around the arabian sea for a while hooked up around the peninsula landed up in sri lanka and was picked up by a sri lankan fisherman Uh, who took the note out read it found the address put it you know put it in an envelope and mailed it off to his wife and she got the letter in madras 27 days after he had thrown the bottle out into the sea so this is a guy then you know when we met him in 1988 this little smallish thinish man you know who was uh, an iit dropout not really you know didn't have any degree or anything like that he had already been done this you know fantastic uh, sort of um, uh, expedition into the lakshadweep when he went to the andamans in 1979 and came back and wrote a report and the andamans are a group of 400 islands uh, or, or more depending on how you count them nicobar is another group of like 30 40 islands his first lines are uh, in the interest of brevity i will list all the islands not surveyed okay so he basically visited every island that had a beach between 1978 and 1979 uh 1985 he became the first person to he was doing uh, sea turtle surveys in papua uh west papua which is sort of the indonesia part of the whole papua png uh island uh also known as irian jaya and so on uh and he visited these remote beaches there and uh was the first outsider to have visited those islands um and um Uh, he didn't know it then but 10 years later when some other americans went there they were convinced that the uh, there was a foreigner who had come there and put all these metal tags on turtles and uh, a few years later they found that the number of turtles was going down uh, so they was con- they were convinced that this guy who came and tagged these turtles these metal tags uh, that had gone back to his <coughs> home land wherever that was and had used a giant magnet to s- attract all the turtles back to his homeland so there was satish was a legend on s- some remote village on the west coast of papua as the guy who came and stole their turtles so you know 1988 i was 19 and this guy was already this this enormous i mean little known but he was this legend in the community he had done things that uh, you know we uh, Uh, when you're young and you want to become a scientist you there are things that you aspire to but we were pretty certain even th- then that satish had done things that that none of us could ever repeat so uh yeah so i've spent pretty much uh you know the rest of you know my my life with turtles has been uh i've always felt that i wanted to bring satish's you know uh, heroic exploits to to light in fact i guess one of the tags he put in 78 got got back in 2009 or so right as in for the turtles one of the turtles that he did ta- tagged tagged in at at some no i think there was I, i i think it was a turtle that he tagged in the in, in the early 90s maybe which 
did get uh, was uh, cited again in the Andamans in uh, in the Nicobar story in uh, the uh, early 2000s, perhaps. Yeah. And I guess consequently, I guess you you also got uh, like worked with uh, you worked with Rom, and that's when Rom came into the life as well. <laughs> Could you elaborate on his influence? Yeah, bro, well, Rom is another one of those sort of really influential characters in uh, in Indian herpetology. And uh, when I when I started working on this book, uh, it was initially supposed to be a fairly uh, typical, you know, one of those wildlife biologists memoirs of, you know, um, I did research on sea turtles and as part of my research, I went to all these interesting places and that's how the, the you know, my original uh, idea of the book began. Uh, I was fortunate in 2000. Uh, tend to get the, the New India Foundation Fellowship uh, and which put a whole new perspective on it because you know it gives you a year to, to take time off and so I decided to go and interview all these people who had worked with, uh, with sea turtles and actually like get their stories as well and not just mine. Uh, and that's when I discovered the number of people around the country who in some form or the other had really been inspired into a career in, in herpetology whether it was sea turtles or any other group by Rom. Uh, so I talk to talk to these people, and the stories would start, you know, uh, somewhat similar to mine. Would be I was in college, I didn't like my classes, so I was hanging around Snake Park, and this uh, white guy came up to me and said, uh, you know, free time, come and help us clean snake pits, and uh, you know, sort of begins over there, and then they spend the rest of their careers becoming uh, famous wildlife filmmakers like Shekhar Dattatri, uh, you know. Uh, Satish Bhaskar, who of course sort of focused on sea turtles, um, uh, you know, Harry Andrews, who went on to be become the curator of uh, the uh, of the Crocodile Bank for many many years and started the field, sta field station in the Andamans. Indranil Das, who's one of the best known uh, uh, you know herb taxonomists in the world, uh, all of these guys basically started out with uh, you know with with Rom sort of throwing them this uh, uh, this little line and then reeling them in. Uh, he uh, we started the first sea turtle conservation program in India in 1973 when they started these turtle walks on the on the Madras coast. Uh, he started the first crocodile work in India uh, with his through the Madras Crocodile Bank. Uh, the first work on king cobras, uh, uh, starting with the islands and the Western Ghats. Uh, of course, all of his works on snakes. Uh, the Irula Cooperative Society, which still is the largest producer of of uh, uh, venom for anti-venom production. Uh, so, I mean, he's really been this sort of iconic figure and you know, one is grateful, uh, you know, it, it's a it's good fortune that his mother decided to move to India in the 1950s and bring her, bring her children with her and, and he just sort of ended up loving the place and, uh, you know, following briefly going to college in the US came back and then uh, eventually, of course, in the, in the 70s itself became an Indian citizen because uh, there was no other way for him to visit the Andamans. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I mean, he's really a uh, you know he's a he's a white Indian of American origin, but like his his heart is here, and what he's done for Indian herpetology is quite uh, uh, quite remarkable. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I guess many of you, if you know of Rom, it's like he really anchors the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust and so many things, the Agumbe Rainfall Research Station. Apart from all the work that is being done in the Andamans, so maybe if you have free time, you should simply drop by at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust and. He'll ask you to clean the snake pit, of course. Yeah, moving on, I guess. Uh, I want <coughs> to kind of uh, move on to the next phase, like where you talk about things on uh, taking on the conservation bit itself. I would want to quote what you've written here. It says, there is little doubt that the individuals concerned are deeply passionate and committed to conservation. But the question is, does the shouting help conservation or does it just help the NGOs? At heart, are environmental organizations any different from the corporations they claim to battle? Basically, you're talking about the misplaced politics of misplaced agenda of large NGOs and how it took, took on Greenpeace and a whole bunch of them across. I guess that's a nice... Uh, well, we're jumping thing. right into it now, aren't we? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I think there's... Uh, uh, conservation, like any other social enterprise, is, is complex. And uh, there's... Uh, there's a larger notion that that certain issues are are black and white, and conservation is one of those issues that people have long assumed. Uh, at least conservationists have long assumed that there's a there's a right and a wrong, there's a black and a white, there's a good and a bad, uh, 
and uh, so it's been a it's been built up as a as a you know as a dichotomous sort of uh, uh, world. Uh, companies are bad, development is bad. You know, uh, all of the things that people do, anthropogenic impacts are bad, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> one of the sort of contexts in, in which this came to light was, uh, and uh, which I sort of the, the examples with which I explored it in the book are uh, a port that was being built in a at a site in Odisha, very close to where. Uh, there is a mass nesting beach for olive ridley turtles and it's one of the most important beaches for tur olive ridley turtles in the world. Um, and uh, mass nesting beaches essentially are where these, where these turtles come and nest in, uh, so usually turtles nest in, on beaches in tens and maybe hundreds and so on. Uh, but on these mass nesting beaches there are hundreds of thousands of turtles and these hundreds of thousands nest within, the ma within a matter of a few days. So these are really spectacular events where there's, you know, you see like 50,000 turtles on one beach on one night. And there's only about six or seven such, uh, maybe now about 10 or 11 such beaches in the world and all of the rest are on the uh, Pacific coast of um, Central America. So Mexico and Costa Rica and now uh, more recently Panama and Guatemala and so on. Uh, and outside of that, the only other known such beaches were on the east coast of India in Orissa. So, uh, think about it at a global scale. Uh, these are really important, important beaches. Uh, and obviously, when uh, there were port development plans, there was concern that this development would lead to erosion and those beaches would get washed off. And one of the most important sites for olive ridley turtles would be badly affected. And so, there was legitimately uh, a great deal of environmental concern. Uh, uh, from from all of us, uh, in the early 2000s, and this went through a few rounds of uh, different companies uh, were involved in the construction of the port, uh, and uh, including uh, LNT and so on. Uh, and it sort of meandered along for a while because they didn't get the funding that they needed to build it. And in the sort of some sometime in the early 2000s, the Dhamra Port Company Limited was formed. LNT was was part of it, and uh, then the Tatas got involved. Uh, and when the when it started building up steam, uh, the protests also sort of built up, and the protests came from multiple NGOs, such as you know the, all of the usual uh, the large NGOs in India, such as Greenpeace and, and BNHS and WWF and so on. Now, in the course of this, in, in the course of this, uh, the Tata's actually reached out to the NGOs and said, "Why don't you know? Why don't we have discussions so that we can a uh, arrive at scientific decisions about whether the port will have negative impacts on, on these turtles and uh, if they will then we can then the, then the company can make a decision based on that information and uh, if it will not I mean if, if depending on how severe those impacts are are there any ways in which we can mitigate it so <clears throat> this went this this over several years this dialogue debate rhetoric uh, occurred in, in many boardroom meetings, in newspapers, on the street in protests and so on. Uh, what was really interesting to me was that was the, you would expect that this entire period of, this, of the battle over the sport, there would be the company and all of its supporters on one side and all of the NGOs and, you know, and the scientists and conservationists on the other side because it seems like the company wants the port and uh, the conservationists don't. In the span of that five years, however, uh, if I you know, wrote their names on, on pieces of paper and put them in a box and pull, pull them out at random. Every possible alliance took place. Uh, there, was a there was a point where uh, the, uh, the Indian NGOs did not, had collectively decided not to engage with the, ta with the company because, you know, certain conditions of, of that engagement were not met. Uh, Tata's went out and, and signed, signed an agreement with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, and so the IUCN was contracted to do a consultancy to help them mitigate the impacts of their port on sea turtles as a project that, uh, that they had a million dollars for over a period of three or four years. Uh, so there was a point where there was an international NGO that was in alliance with the company and was on, you know, was on that side of the, of the net and all of the Indian NGOs were on the other side of the net. Uh, there was a point of time when uh, there was a fairly strong rift between, the, uh, between conservationists, NGOs and so on because uh, uh, we couldn't agree on the terms with on which we wanted to engage with the company. Uh, of course, there were people that were that were on the extreme side of that debate who were saying, 
uh, unless they stop all construction on the port uh, till we have completed our studies, uh, we should not engage with them. And a bunch of people said, that just doesn't sound reasonable. You're asking a company to put their entire program on hold for one or two or more years till you provide them with data. Uh, they're not going to do that. At least they're giving you an opportunity to you know, give them some input. Uh, so there were various sort of points of view on that. Uh, there was a point at which uh, I actually um, got to know that since Green, Greenpeace was providing the most adverse publicity in the public, uh, in, sort of in the media, uh, there was actually a private meeting between the Tatas and Greenpeace, which uh, none of the others knew about. So every, you know, the, the politics of this was, was not as simple as, you know, there are bad guys who are building ports who will kill these nice turtles and, you know, there's a, there are these nice guys who will save these turtles. The bigger problem for me actually was that uh, a lot of what the NGOs was doing did not actually seem to be serving the larger benefit of the turtles itself. Uh, if you sort of took each of their publicity events and the campaigns and all that, sure, it got more publicity for the NGOs that were doing this. It, it appeared that they were on the side of the turtles. But if you looked at the actual consequences of their action itself, it was not having any positive outcomes. So, it, so I kept asking the question, if you've done it once and you know it isn't working, why are you spending time and effort on doing that thing again? The only thing that I see this doing, doing is raising the profile of the organization and not actually bringing any benefit for sea turtles or marine ecosystems. Uh, and so therefore, I mean, I, I'm not answering that question. I'm asking that question. Why do NGOs do what they do? Uh, and the larger these NGOs get, the larger, the more international they are, the bigger their budgets are. Um, remember that, you know, I said $1 million as a project that IUCN spent on, 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 on sea turtles and, and all this stuff. Uh, Conservation International spends $1 million on its annual dinner. So when you get to that size, uh, the question has to be asked, what are you really serving? I guess also there is this mention that you, how, like you write about sorry, how... Sorry. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, what is the all right. Yeah, and also there is also a mention of uh, a sort of a protest that they did in Delhi, right? They took a turtle and then uh, sort of to kind of glamorize things there. Yeah, I... Was it part of this or previous, prior to well, that? Well, actually this was, uh, they also protested, um, they also protested uh, against well. the, they were, they were protesting against the, uh, the uh, uh, trawler related mortality of, of Oliver Ridley turtles, so every year uh, several thousand turtles get caught in trawl fishing nets and uh, and die, and uh, through the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of biologists and conservationists, including myself, um, raised I would say a hue and a cry about it. Uh, over over time, I think now if you ask me, uh, I would say that yes, those turtles. I, I would prefer it if those turtles didn't die. Uh, because they, they, they die and then they, they wash up and they lie dead on the beach and they, they stink and they rot over there. Uh, you know, if you're going to kill 5,000 turtles, you may as well eat them. Uh, that's, that's a lot of good protein that's going to waste. Uh, secondary question is, does killing 5,000 turtles affect the population? The answer appears to be no. Uh, those, those turtles are increasing, seem to be increasing in number. Uh, but in the early 2000s, there was a lot of concern that these five or 10,000 turtles that were drying in trawl fishing nets would actually have this very severe impact on the population. Genuine concern. Now, Greenpeace's approach to that was to was to highlight this as a you know uh, in in the media bring a lot of attention to it and their assumption was that this sort of uh, this let's call it high end publicity actually leads to uh, leads to changes on the ground and uh, what I point out is that uh, uh, bringing attention science communication is, is about bringing attention to issues uh, bringing attention to issues is good uh, but uh, Social systems are complex. So typically what would happen is when, when uh, these folks would, would go out and make these public protests in front of the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, head of the forest department in, in Orissa and Bhubaneswar in front of the, uh, the legislative assembly and so on, uh, the head of the forest department would get, would, uh, it's embarrassing for them. So they would make all these public statements. Uh, the Greenpeace guys would get arrested. Uh, all of that would happen. But at the end of the day, he would call up a junior officer, who would call up a junior officer, who would call up a junior officer. And finally, some guy on the field would be, would be forced to show some, uh, some action. Now, the junior most guy on the field uh, doesn't actually have the power 
uh, all the infrastructure, you know, the, the marine vessels and all of that to actually take on these trawler guys who are actually also politically very powerful. So that guy would just go catch up a bunch, catch a bunch of local fishermen, beat them up, confiscate the nets, and file a report saying that I've, you know, I've done my job. Uh, so the consequences of their actions were was really not the result that they were seeking. Uh, and 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 so the, one of the things that I always questioned was, you know, apart from the fact that you guys got publicity for being thrown in jail, did this really? bring about the change that you wanted. I'm not questioning your intentions. I, I know very well that the Greenpeace guys also, yes, they want turtles to be saved. They don't want them to die in, tra die in troll nets. Yeah, I totally buy the intention. But none of their actions were actually having the consequences that they, that they wanted. But they didn't seem to be able to tear themselves away from that particular mode of uh, uh, operation. Yeah. In fact, on the same note, right? So you also like articulate something on hype hurts, as in you quote Nicholas Smurovsky as to how in one of the meetings he kind of raised an issue that over-reporting of some of these was causing a concern. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I, 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 and I don't even have to talk about turtles for that. We can talk about tigers. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you I mean, can sense that a host of other turtles things. Turtles or tigers or whatever it is, we've made so much of, we've made so much noise about some of these charismatic species that actually, so uh, there are two or three problems that, that, that come to my mind. One is that you end up focusing your attention around some of these charismatic species which are not even the most endangered or threatened, right? And there is a sort of like there's this, you know, vague loose assumption that if we save tigers, we're saving everything else. If we save turtles, we're saving everything else. Uh, mostly not true uh, because very often the what the money gets spent on, what the, what the agencies like the forest department end up spending their time on, end up being very species specific and not actually capturing, uh, you know, capturing that larger ecosystem value that we're, that we're hoping to. Uh, <coughs> so I like to frame it differently in the sense that I, li I like to say that, that sea turtles are, or audibility turtles are, are flagships, great. Now that I've caught your attention, now that you came for this talk because it was about sea turtles, forget about sea turtles. Uh, what's really important are the marine ecosystems. And if we're able to do, you know, do the right things to save the marine ecosystems, then sure, uh, it's fairly likely that sea turtles will be saved. Uh, honestly, despite my love for sea turtles, if you, if the devil offered me a bargain and said, uh, I'll give you healthy marine ecosystems, but they'll have no sea turtles in it, I'll take that bargain. Uh, five species is, is a small price to pay for a, for a larger benefit. But I think people working on single species tend to lose sight of that. Uh, the second thing that happens with hype is that the moment you say something's going to go extinct tomorrow, day after tomorrow, next week, then we have to act now. Uh, and we don't do sensible things when we have to act now. Uh, we invariably do, you know, we have knee-jerk reactions that uh, often don't even have short-term benefits, but sometimes don't even have, uh, but don't, uh, well, sometimes they have short-term benefits, but very often they don't even have short-term benefits, and they definitely do not have medium and long-term benefits. So we're not doing any long-term planning, uh, we're, we're not sort of putting plans in place that actually help uh, ecosystems in the long run. And finally, it's a really great way to alienate people. So when you have these, when the moment you put these, these species on a pedestal and, you know, uh, you, you say, I have to save them at any cost, then, uh, you know, uh, there are cons consequences like the, 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 the death of a single animal, for example, is unacceptable, right? So it doesn't matter if that animal is causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of, of, of people, but you suddenly put that animal on a bigger pedestal than you have your fellow human beings. Uh, now that's a personal choice for people as a philosophy, but it's not a great way to get uh, get people's support because you've immediately sort of alienated uh, usually poor marginal communities because they're the ones who are actually living in contact with these animals. So you immediately alienated them from conservation. Uh, today there's this massive debate that if you Google it online, you'll find the debate on crocodile conflict in the islands. Now there are people living in cities who don't believe these crocodiles should be killed. Uh, but they're not the ones whose hands and legs and bodies are in danger when they fish or swim in those, uh, you know, in those creeks and or bathe or wash their clothes in those streams. So fishermen, fishermen are getting killed in the Andamans, but that's okay because it's only 10 or 20 of them, right? But it wouldn't be okay if it was 10 or 20 of, of, of us, right? Uh, so, the, you know, you've put this crocodile on a pedestal and you've said, oh, crocodiles must be conserved at any cost uh, because they're really endangered or whatever the, the reason is or because you believe in an animal rights philosophy. Uh, now, you've immediately lost that entire constituency over there, which perhaps there was a way for them to, there in fact, 
the communities in the Nicobar live perfectly happily with crocodiles. Uh, when they think large crocodiles are a threat to them, they go out and hunt them. Uh, the uh, children grow up knowing that there are crocodiles in those streams. Uh, so there's perfectly a way for people to coexist with crocodiles on, as long as they've built their own relationships. Now, you've imposed your value system on them uh, as it happens on faulty data. Uh, you know, human nature coexistence, I, I think that's where hype really hurts. I guess also you, you like moving on and like leading to that uh, sort of leads to looking at the consequences of conservation, right? Particularly something that you wrote about the total conservation project, right? That happened in uh, Lakshadweep and all of those places. And you also nicely articulate on East Mall Beautiful and how involving communities, like <coughs> uh, uh, and largely having local interventions than larger things coming in. Could you please elaborate on that? Yeah, I yeah. Um, I think in you know in my experience with moving you know say segueing from from the idea that we that that when conservation comes with a sort of this homogeneous uh, philosophy that there's there's a lot of work on the history of conservation thought and uh, uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, what we think of as conservation today evolved from this idea of pristine wildernesses in uh, North America. Uh, people like uh, Aldo Leopold and John Muir um, and Gifford Pinchot who, came, who, was, who pioneered the National Park Service uh, essentially built conservation around the idea of pristine nature and, and therefore setting aside these wildernesses that did not have people in it at all. Uh, it's an idea that, that, that uh, has been uh, that that template has been re, you know reproduced in many parts of the world, such as Africa and Latin America and so on, through through large NGOs like uh, Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy and so on. Uh, uh, in India, it, it it beautifully mapped on to our own traditions. Before in the, you know before the British were here, uh, the various princely states had their hunting preserves. So there was the idea of setting. You know these preserves aside for rich people already existed in India. So uh, the uh, you know the idea of wilderness, the Western idea of wilderness, mapped you know into a sort of a, in, into some of our own traditions of of setting these uh, these these areas aside, whether whether they were sacred groves or hunting preserves or whatever. So in some sense, uh, this was a this was a happy meeting of of, uh, of philosophies. Uh, and then in, in the early 70s, it, it got formalized through the Wildlife Protection Act, through, the, through our own national park and sanctuary network. So the na national park and sanctuary uh, you know, framework derives both from the ideas of, of conservation that Prime Minister Indira Gandhi got from her interactions with, with Western leaders, uh, as well as from sort of a, a kind of historical tradition over here. Many of the national parks and sanctuaries were at the boundaries are actually those old hunting preserves that had been set aside before. All of these essentially treat nature and people as, as, as separate. Uh, and so we go into the 1980s with a global paradigm that, that you know, conservation means no people. Uh, it's really ironic because what they found were these beautiful sort of uh, uh, grasslands where the, where the bison roamed, which you know, Moore and others thought of as these pristine wildernesses, actually had been maintained by Native American communities for centuries. So there was no... The, the, the were, the, the, there are pristine areas on, on earth, there's no doubt about it, but the idea of what these people considered to be pristine was not pristine at all. Uh, the British went up to the Nilgiris and so on and, and, and saw these beautiful grasslands and they reminded them of these rolling hills of Yorkshire and so on. Uh, those had also been maintained by, I mean, grasslands had come there millions of years ago, but they'd been maintained in a particular form by human communities moving there also a, a thousand plus years ago. Uh, so the idea of, of pristineness really was something to be uh, questioned. And the larger question to ask over there is how, how much do we want to impose this, this normative value of conservation that some small group of you know, powerful uh, elite in a sense have come up with. And that was, is really what uh, a number of uh, uh, let's call them uh, philosophers of conservation, social scientists through the 1990s uh, started to question. Uh, and they said, why should the philosophy of conservation stem only from this one sort of 
uh, you know, be so you know, narrow and one-sided. Uh, let's broaden our view of co what conservation is. Let's engage with the different ways that, that different communities around the world interact with, uh, with nature and maybe there's something to be, uh, to be learned and uh, something to be gained from uh, integrating all of that into a much broader notion of what, what conservation is. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the idea of, in, in fact, it's like now integrated into all of the CBD and the UN and so on, the idea of uh, community-based conservation, engaging people with conservation, rights-based conservation and so on. Uh, you still have people on different sides of the fence, uh, but the movement for, for engaging communities uh, in conservation is much stronger. Um, I'll make the distinction, however, that people look at it in two, in two different ways. Uh, there are some people who look at it purely, uh, that, uh, that look at it as, as rights, that all communities, all people have a right to frame how they will interact with nature and we can have certain common shared values such as, you know, sustainability and so on. Uh, but people have, people have rights to engage with that discussion and therefore that's why we need to in include communities because it's the right thing to do. Uh, there are a number of conservationists and conservation organizations that, that have a lot of community based programs. Uh, but for many people it's purely instrumental in the sense that they've realized that this is the only way they, it could work. Uh, so it's like it, it no longer works to exclude people from conservation so let's, so we have to include them uh, not necessarily because they think that it's the environmentally just, uh, the, the just thing to do but because it's the practical thing to do. Uh, so there's uh, the former, there's, there's a very large movement around uh, environmental justice is, which is basically the idea of social justice meets conservation uh, and then there's the idea of pragmatic conservation. Both of them end with communities but they kind of actually derive from fairly different uh, philosophies. So, uh, was that something that also prompted you to start Dakshin and current conservation? Uh, Dakshin certainly. So, uh, Dakshin's a, uh, Dakshin Foundation is an NGO that works on coastal and marine conservation in India and we have uh, uh, <coughs> field sites in, on both the east and west coasts of the mainland and we work extensively in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and the Lakshadweep. Uh, and it was very much started with the philosophy that, that uh, conservation and environmental sustainability really needs to not just engage with communities but start with communities. Uh, so a lot of our work derives from actually uh, trying to develop what those, what those programs are themselves through engagement with the community. So start, you know, we, we have a lot of, we do a lot of fisheries research, you know, a lot of work on flagship, uh, uh, flagship and iconic species. We have programs that, that engage with governance of fishing communities, mostly marginal artisanal communities. Uh, but what we've tried to do is with our larger sort of integrative programs to actually go and work with the community first to find out what, what they think the issues are. Uh, a lot of research and conservation programs start with the, sci the scientist or the, or, the, or the activist even uh, in NGOs framing the problem first and then going and talking to the communities, you know, and we wanted to flip that around and say, what if we went and asked them what it is? So if we're going to come here and help you, what, it is that, what, what is it that you would like us to help you with? What are the things that you think would be useful for us to do, uh, you know, in this community uh, to help you uh, sustainably use and manage your natural resources? Uh, so at no point questioning the use uh, of the natural resource itself, but asking how that, how one might help them uh, sustain that. Uh, so we in fact try and avoid the question, uh, try and avoid the word conservation itself uh, as far as we can. And what about current conservation? Uh, current conservation was more of a, was more of a, uh, you know, labor of, labor of love. Uh, it's, it's a magazine that tries to marry art and science. Uh, initially started with the idea of, of bringing, you know, of, of communicating rigorous science in a way that, that, you know, the, you know, that could reach out to a popular audience uh, and uh, was mostly done through you know, photographs and other kinds of you know, graphs and visuals and so on. Uh, but a few years later, I, for, a, for, a, for a brief time, I had a co-editor who uh, was uh, also an ecologist, uh, but uh, sort of broke the mold a little bit and said, what if we bring you know, art, illustration and design into this, into, into this product? And uh, it's sort of become a magazine where, where we say where art meets science. And what we're trying to do is bring together 
uh, bring together ways of communication where, where science and art can talk to each other. Uh, the goal is still sort of reaching a larger audience, uh, but with, uh, it's kind of an experiment on how these very different domains can, uh, can talk to each other. And uh, I got to say, I struggle with it in the sense that as someone who's trained as a scientist, it, it really sometimes, uh, it's, it's difficult to cross that barrier uh, and, 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 and try and, and fully understand where, where people are coming from on the, you know, in, from this entirely different domain. And I'm sure that they struggle with trying to understand, you know, the scientist uh, uh, quite as much. But, but it's, I think it's in breaking those barriers that some interesting things happen. I guess, was it Suneha? Sorry? Was it Suneha? Uh, no, it was actually Nandini Rajamani, oh, who uh, yes, right. is now a faculty in one of the ISERs. ISER, yeah. Tirupati. Right. So Neha was the managing, managing editor at the time, also a scientist, but an artist by, you know, by, by passion. And I think her also, her own sort of, uh, you know, training as a scientist, but love of art was, a, was also a key process in making, you know, making the, uh, making the transition. Mm. So, uh, for those of you, if you may not know of Current Conservation, it's a very interesting uh, magazine which like merges both art and science there. And that's something Karthik edits and has been managing to bring it out. Currentconservation.org. Sorry, currentconservation.org. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Moving on, I guess, uh, what's your take on uh, how do we kind of, uh, or what should, as many of them, uh, let me first hear in Sweetie Dwellers, what is the role that Viko one could play in, in the conservation of sea turtles or looking um, at it. Yeah, well, a little hard to engage with sea turtles living in Bangalore, but uh, I think the sea turtles are a kind of shining example of, of how uh, uh, people uh, out in civil society can engage with the conservation of, you know, of uh, uh, wildlife or, or, you know, or, or nature in general. Uh, some of these iconic species, you know, are, are more uh, accessible than, than others. Uh, and sea turtles are particularly so. I, I often ask people whether they, you know, what they think the most widespread uh, target of, of conservation globally is in terms of what, which species has the most conservation individuals or conservation groups across the world. Uh, and, you know, I, I haven't actually done like, you know, I haven't checked this quantitatively, but the answer is probably sea turtles because there are sea turtle conservation programs in more than 70 countries worldwide. Pretty much every country that has a coastline worldwide has some conservation organization working on sea turtles. Inland, I think there's just, you know, there are other, there are so many other sort of attractive accessible groups like, you know, there's, there's birding groups everywhere, there's, there's now there's, I think, uh, uh, groups of people interested in flora, documenting flora, uh, butterflies. And I think citizen science contribution to these uh, builds both an engagement with that system. Uh, Bangalore, for example, with lakes, right? There's such a wonderful movement for lakes in Bangalore, which gets citizens connected to, you know, to nature in a, in a way, to, well, it's specifically water, but then, you know, all of the things that go with it. Uh, and it builds, it, it provides, uh, it, you know, it provides a, a much larger data set with which uh, conservationists, scientists, you know, uh, hydrologists can make arguments to the, you know, to the government to, to make better policy. Uh, so I think it, you know, it, it sort of, the, the, the public engagement has multiple sort of good benefits. Uh, and, uh, so I think there's opportunities pretty much uh, uh, in, in, in every place that, in, in every city at least, perhaps not so much the smaller towns, but I think those will soon start to uh, catch up as well. But one thing I must uh, confess and sort of envy you is because all the uh, opportunities you get to visit all the wonderful beaches, part of looking at sea turtles. Yeah, um, I, I, I was saying before that I uh, I meet my colleagues at the at the Indian Institute of Science from you know the physics and engineering and chemistry departments and even my own division of biology who basically think I'm mostly on holiday because you know I'm usually having just come back from Orissa or just come back from the Andamans and and they're like yeah you don't work you know you don't really work and uh, you know you guys are just like going to pretty places and you know having a good time and that sort of thing and they don't really think we do any research and uh, you know I've, over time I've, I've come come to just say yeah that's true you know, <laughs> tough luck, guys. You should have chosen, chosen ecology as a as a as a career. Um, I've actually been taken to task by people by saying, you know, in, in jest, saying you get 
taxpayers money to do this and i'm like yeah thank you for paying uh, <laughs> for my trip to the andamans um, but yeah we do I, i think one of the uh, one of the perks of the profession certainly is to go to these places um, you could get you, you you get haunted by malaria sand flies uh by, by mosquitoes you could get cerebral malaria uh you could get stranded on islands you could your boat could capsize so there's you know i uh, i think none of those people that are jealous of us would actually survive those trips <laughs> but at the end of it uh, uh uh if i had to make those choices again this is exactly where i'd be yeah i can sort of relate to the like incident this is a uh, part of one of our ces field works in uttar kannada uh sent for ecological sciences we have a field station in kumta and there is a jeep that the ces maintains and there is a field station so for one of the frog works we were doing in, in the late evening so for frog watch we have to like sample late evening like around this time post 7 pm so we had like uh, a few of us are there there is this iac jeep which which says government of india a curious villager comes by and ask what is what are you guys doing we say we are watching frogs he's like are you getting paid we said yes and he says yes okay this is a government of india jeep yes He's like has a government gone nuts they're paying you to watch frogs and sending a jeep <laughs> yes so we have so but part of the thing is that we also survived a lot of snake scares as in uh, pit vipers are pretty common like like kartik mentioned right so there are a whole bunch of things and getting stuff getting chased like by that. elephants yeah um, but yeah, uh, yeah all of it cool uh, i'll throw open to a few questions to the audience but uh, for which i also I'll come back with a couple more as well on how students can participate and what they what lies ahead and things like that conservation you said you will tell us uh, the future so is it only for students or for also working professionals it could be for working professionals so one of the things i had in mind and what i would want uh, karthik to elaborate more is there is this uh, conference on student conservation conser- conference in conservation science which is pretty unique and uh, we also have something called as at as in young ecologists talk and interact it's been one of the very very good uh, coalition or sort of network of uh, professionals students and all of them uh, i would like like more than me i would like karthik to talk about it uh yes the this um there's a the last i think since 2010 there's been a uh, a student con- conference on conservation science at the jain tata auditorium in in iisc uh, it's usually in september but this year it's in october uh <coughs> it's a conference f- for students and it was modeled on a, on a on a similar conference that was started in cambridge and now there's things there's seven or eight around the world and it's a it's quite a remarkable gathering of about 4 500 students from around the country uh focused on on conservation but it's open for for other people to attend as well and it's a it's a sort of a nice gathering to get a broad sense of what happens in the community uh there's a I think what might be really interesting to working professionals is that there's a who's who session which is basically a set of stalls by NGOs so one gets to go around and see who's doing what and what part of the city or in what part of the country uh so it's a it's good one stop shop to know about about conservation in 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 general uh and the other one that he mentioned is not is is uh, is the is even more unique in a sense because it's organized exclusively by students of ecology it happens once in two or three years uh, it's called yeti uh and uh, uh yeti yeti as in Y-E-T-I. bigfoot uh, abominable snowman uh, young ecologists talk and interact uh, and that was started in bangalore again it started but was started by students of ecology of uh, iisc and ncbs and so on uh, but that one's uh, become a uh, sort of like a uh a roving model so it it has been held several times in the in northeast india because the students themselves felt that uh students from that region don't get an opportunity to attend conferences so it's been held in guwahati and uh nagaland i think and uh, other cities as well delhi and so on delhi and baroda so last thing. so all the marine conservation is same or 
I call myself a, 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 a you know, I, I sometimes describe myself as a fake marine biologist because many turtle people work on turtles when they come ashore on land to nest, and actually, the, you know, it's 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 a joke uh, that that. Uh, you know, sometimes it might not be funny, but many turtle biologists that I know from, like, from India and elsewhere, uh, at least from the previous generation, didn't actually know how to swim. And <laughs> it's kind of a, it's kind of strange, right? You you work on marine turtles and you've never seen them in the water. Actually, you work on them when they come ashore on land. Uh, so I am hesitant when people say I work on turtle biology to conflate it with, you know, with with marine biology. Uh, however, more and more, I think. Uh, uh, there are people that are interested in marine biology and conservation in India, and so there's a lot, lot more happening with uh, with marine species, with actual marine ecosystems uh, across different kinds of institutions. Sorry. What do you is conservation? What is conservation? What is conservation? Uh, you have not gone to the idea of pristine or the old philosophy. We call it as a old philosophy. Is conservation? Let's call it another philosophy. I mean, I, th I think there are. So, um, uh, conservation means different things to different people. Uh, if you ask me what I think conservation is, to me, uh, conservation comprises uh, a sustainable use of natural resources. Uh, elements of uh, sustainable use of natural resources equitably by people. Uh, so uh, there's a very strong element of environmental justice that people from different uh, spheres and, and classes uh, have an equal access to to nature, not and to its multifarious benefits. Uh, so there's a uh, today there's an ecosystem services framework which looks at the services that nature provides, uh, such as uh, you know, economic benefits, pr provisioning benefits, you know, clean water, clean air, that sort of thing. Uh, but also aesthetic cultural uh, benefits as well. So you can, look at, you can look at our relationship with nature along all of those axes. Uh, for us to be sustainably able to, uh, to access those and uh, uh, equally be able to access those, uh, to me that's conservation. Um, equally as in who is equal? People. Their access also is and when we go and mine, we are denying access to the elephant. Sure. So where is that equal? Uh, we can uh, the, one can have a long debate about whether animals have rights or not, and there's sort of like lots has been written about it. Um, the problem with ascribing rights to to animals is that. There's, uh, it's very hard to uh, to devolve that to to re resolve that into a uh, set of non-contradictory actions. Uh, if I were to if I were to ascribe rights to elephants, uh, what about to the uh, trees that they debark? Uh, if I were to ascribe rights to a tiger, what about to the deer that it kills? If I were to ascribe rights to, you know, then where do I also where do I draw the line? Why draw the line at elephants? Why not? What about mosquitoes? Um, are we willing to ascribe rights to uh, all all animals? What so, I yeah. So, and sharing of resources to everybody is what you said, equality people. Yeah. My question was, uh, am I I'm audible? Right? Am yeah, I yeah, quite audible. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, um, what I meant was. Um, Equality of um, usage by other species is too. That's what I meant. Like, um, if if um, I mean the, the 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 environment is as much ours as it's theirs. So, um, I mean, not getting into the nitty gritties of whether the tiger eats it. Eats, I mean, that's 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 part of its uh, you know life cycle, if I may put it that way. Um, but what I meant was, do they not have do, should they not have access to um, environmental resources as much as we do? I mean, is that not part of conservation? How would you resolve that question? I mean, uh, was it, would it be uh, 3,000 elephants, 10,000 elephants, 100,000 elephants?
you know, what's, what's, the, what's the practical next step to that question, right? The only question that, that uh, as a, um, uh, as a scientist involved in environmental sustainability or conservation that I can ask is uh, whether, the, whether I can maintain what, what is a, um, uh, a sustainable population of, of, of elephants. Uh, even that's a normative question. Uh, do I want, uh, the people say 100, 100 years ago there were what, 40,000 tigers? Do I want 40,000 tigers in India? Sure, that's a normative decision. Somebody could make the decision that I want 40,000 tigers in India. Why 40,000? Why not 100,000 tigers in India? So, uh, and then on the other end one can say, all right, you've got 150 tigers in, in on this thing. Uh, I'm going to make sure that, that that's, uh, that's viable. Uh, why should I not have only 150 tigers, right? So, before we even ascribe the talk about, you know, space, resources, the right to, to share those resources and so on, there's, we're actually asking some very, you know, questions to which we can only give answers based on our, on a norm, right? There's no, the, a scientist cannot give an, right. an absolute mm -hmm. answer to say that, 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 I might be able to say, okay, anything less than a thousand elephants is, is really unsustainable because the genetic diversity is too low. Some, you know, there might be some population thing and they'll, they'll go extinct. So that's, you know, I, I want to have, you know, for me to feel secure about the future of, of elephants or tigers, uh, I'd like there to be, uh, uh, you know, I've done population analysis and I think there needs to be 3000 or that that's a minimum. But above that, it's a norm, right? It's, it's, a, it's a value judgment. Uh, and so one can only ask questions in my opinion about, about how one can, uh, you know, practically and, and pragmatically make, uh, you know, uh, make space available for, uh, for ecosystems to function uh, rather than about individual species. Yeah. So, uh, if I'm I may happy to sort of like uh, I, I elaborate on that later, but right. you're, if you're asking what are the spaces we need for ecosystem function, uh, there are now increasing, that there are more and more studies that talk about, that are engaging with, you know, how, how much how much green cover do we need for carbon sequestration to mitigate the effects of climate change? Uh, that's a very practical question uh, about what's, what's, the, what's the amount of, 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 of green cover, what's the amount of, what are the number of trees that we need, what are the kinds of trees that we need to mitigate climate change to prevent other environmental disasters. So, sure. Like if I may add on that, right, so it's a really hard question and like, like there's no silver bullet there. Like like uh, like Karthik mentioned earlier, right? So like, if you were to given a choice of saving five <coughs> species of sea turtles in India as against protecting the marine ecosystem, he would choose the latter. So it kind of it it sort of uh, like rests there in that sense. So it's in and clearly it's very difficult thing to say who is important, who is not important. And at a larger level, it is really the ecosystem that we need to see how it functions appropriately. So. Drawing a line is really, really difficult. But yeah, we can continue the conversation. Uh, if I have Tej and then there's one more lady here in the front who wanted. And there's one, one more there. Sir, uh, I'll sit raised earlier, so. Yeah. Uh, actually, my question has to do with frogs, not turtles. Sure. Uh, I'm a local resident and uh, last year in the rainy season, I tried transplanting some frogs from my place of work to my garden. It's a wild garden, it's not a cultivated thing with a lawn and flower beds and things. And uh, I have a couple of ponds into which I release them. I never saw them again. I brought, I brought both adults and little ones. And uh, is there anything I could have done differently or should I have not brought them at all? I, I'm just interested in making a safe space for them. You know, if I could keep a few frogs, not yeah. as pets or anything, but in their natural state. Okay, was this yeah. in Bangalore? Sorry? Was this in Bangalore? Or yeah, yeah, I'm okay. a local resident. Fine. And Karthik also works on frogs. <laughs> yeah, well, it actually depends on what frogs they were actually. Yeah, yeah. could uh, be. I don't the know toads. the species. They may have been toads, for yeah. all I know. I, I don't yeah. know what species they were. Yeah. So, again, depends on what species, like Karthik said. But uh, did you also get some tadpoles along with it? No, they were uh, 
you know like hopping about okay so yeah, they no. actually invaded my office that's how i <laughs> you know got them in a jargon um, most likely it could be like common indian toad or we don't know as in they were big brown ones you know with yes. like speckles all yeah, over yes, them yes. and should be the common indian toad is there anything i could have done differently i mean i, I don't know uh no we haven't really handled them that way we've been only looking at their taxonomy or some of their behaviors like i can go on with some of the others but that will be a digression maybe we can like yesterday there was a uh, like berry brothers movie on the secret life of Wo- frogs that won the dada falke award on uh, for the best documentary so there are a bunch of things on them maybe we can take it up later uh, so <coughs> My question is, uh, there are these citizen science projects like climate shifts and stuff like that. Are they really useful for like real scientists or are they just there? I, mean, like, I know it's a good community project to introduce to kids and stuff, but they are really useful to scientists as such in research? So I think these projects go through like a, like a um, trajectory uh, and uh, I think their utility grows over time uh, for example the 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 ebird data the uh, is now globally being used for uh, you know a variety of analysis by scientists and it's this fantastic data set on on bird communities around the world on changes in those communities over time migration uh, and it's because it's essentially because what's happened over time is that more and more of the uh, of the uh, average bird bird watcher is actually a really good naturalist can identify species really well now if you ask me today if i start uh, e frog uh, for 10 years it will be useless because you know people you know aren't really sure you know what that frog was now b- i'm sure by the next time you would actually know what that frog and the toad is and uh, whether it was frog or a toad to begin with and then over time as as every citizen sort of becomes much more keenly aware of of what those uh what those species are because that's sort of the basic unit of that data is to know what species it is right and then you can add other other information to it so as that knowledge of of species identification and natural history sort of develops in the citizens and that only happens by repeatedly engaging with it then that then the group of citizens themselves becomes becomes your sort of like your your body of of data collectors over time so i the answer is no but unless you go through this phase you can't get to the stage where where they can actually uh, yeah uh, become useful uh, but i also think there's another aspect to it which is you know which you know i've been writing about which is that that we tend to we tend to privilege science in our society somehow we when we say something is scientific we mean that it's like you know believable uh, and i think some of these citizen science programs both for civil society as well as for you know local communities such as you know we work with fishermen and so on is a way of of empowering them to speak a certain language uh, so my the fisherman comes back and says uh, you know uh, i had to go f- further to fish and he says yeah this is because the moon was here and something was there the government guys are like not going to basically believe him but i make him write it you know you know we work with them in the lakshadweep and we make them write it down on a on a data sheet and we make them code it in a particular way then tomorrow they can plot one pie chart or one graph with it and go back with the same thing which they already knew before but now they've written it in a way that the guy in the fisheries department ha- is like oh that's true you guys are traveling 1.5 kilometers further than you were last year uh, or 30% of the days you didn't go fishing was because you didn't get diesel from us now it's data right so it's immediately transformed the way that that you know you can engage with uh, you know different sections of of society so i think it's a uh, you know uh, citizen science is an empowerment tool as much as a it's an engagement tool it's an empowerment tool and like finally if it works out as data for scientists well and good that's a bonus again if i may add like some of them depends on how they are structured and you know run through like we have this open tree mapping where communities are mm-hmm. participating and mapping them they were also like like particularly residents in indira nagar have been very particular of it so that's gaining traction and all of it so you have data that's like put on osm and that remains there so it depends on how the entire life cycle is managed similarly like what karthik said right ebird has been very successful because the data <coughs> is out there like if 
tomorrow or like tonight if you want to access email data you can write to them and you can you'll get a dump of it people are now publishing papers based on eber data so so what started out as like sort of a you know collecting citizen science thing some of it has been really like come out well so it depends on how one organizes and curates it over time and it basically also engages actual citizens so it's a way of empowering citizens to participate and know of their neighborhood particularly so that uh, like the more you know that the less like a coating battery right so the more you know the less you would want to intervene but in more meaningful ways so uh, we should view citizen science as activities in in that sense very interesting talk and very um, you know thought provoking anecdotes that you mentioned my my question is more related to how do we measure the success of a conservation effort uh, we know that in this ecosystem you have different species depending on other species so something is eaten by something else or something is eating something <coughs> else uh, based on that how do you when you look at the network of where the sea turtles are and other species that are depending on it and the species that the turtles themselves depend on um how do you measure the success of a conservation effort in terms of numbers how do you scientifically analyze that part yeah that's a really great question and it's you know it's one of the things that we've we've been increasingly critical of, of ourselves traditionally people have looked at it as saying you know has the number of tigers gone up or has the number of you know turtles gone up and one example that sudhir i alluded to was uh about 10 years ago 10 15 years ago these numbers of green turtles really went up in the lakshadweep it, it, it the fishermen were saying that the numbers were going up dramatically and initially they thought it was because the there was a ban on on hunting them and so because they'd stopped hunting them maybe that's why the numbers had gone up uh and they'd started eating all of the sea grass and even now if you go there these they're wiping the sea grass out which means that the fishermen don't have enough bait fish to catch tuna and so there's like huge sort of like conflict cycle over there uh we don't know for sure but it you know we've been speculating for the last few years that actually it's very likely that conservation efforts in sri lanka uh led to this increase in lakshadweep because from the early 90s this group called turtle conservation project was set up uh, by a british couple and some you know sri lankans they wonderful organization very strong community based work they set up a series of these hatcheries they protected nesting beaches the number of green turtles coming on those to those beaches increased dramatically so as long as tcp was giving reports to their donors they were saying success 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 because the number of green turtles was going up and they had successfully conserved you know the nesting beaches in in sri lanka so you're absolutely right now what's happening a few hundred kilometers away in lakshadweep is that these green turtles are showing up now all these hatchlings are becoming like juveniles showing up and wiping the sea grass out right which is a affecting a whole bunch that ecosystem and a whole bunch of other species that live over there and affecting the fishermen and creating this this sort of this this antipathy towards towards sea turtle conservation as well right so in a way when you sort of when you start picking out uh when you when your metrics become very species focused it it really can lead to this uh imbalance. you know conservation uh, sorry imbalance imbalance absolutely uh now the Uh, it is an uh, well i i i unintended perhaps but it should be foreseen i mean we are ecologists uh, and one of the problems one of the things that we that some researchers have in the social sort of sciences have started to highlight is that we are really are uh, trying to impose static values on dynamic ecosystems mm -hmm. in uh, um uh, sea turtles don't nest every year in fact some turtles some species like leatherbacks and green turtles would nest only once in four or five years and uh, if you just look at it mathematically if every turtle nests once in 4 or 5 years uh, and sometimes they lay, lay five nests a year sometimes seven right so you just throw those numbers into a into a graph you'll get that right because some years all of the turtles turned up to sh to nest other years some smaller proportion of them turned up to nest and this is all just the natural sequence Sorry. now what happens in orissa every year one year there's 20000 turtles and the you know uh, and there are questions in parliament saying why were there only 20000 turtles this year next year there's 500000 turtles and everybody you know newspapers are like uh, you know all our conservation work has been a success now this is really idiotic because you know we think we you know we want there to be x number of turtles or x number of tigers tigers and turtles will go up and down over time uh, the you know imbalance and dynamism is is part of is part of ecology 
uh, that's not an ecology textbook that was written in the 1940s, right? And yet, as conservationists, we want fixed targets. Just, you know, it's just a mismatch of, of, of um, you know, uh, of how the system works and how you want to judge it. So, uh, so I think, but the, I didn't answer your question. Which is how does one ev evaluate whether conservation? Works? When do you draw the line draw the to line? say that I, I conservation has worked and beyond a certain tipping point, it's going to create more imbalance? I I think those questions are very very difficult to answer. I mean, I think that the that that the, the questions that we're trying to grapple with really uh, are more in terms of of ecosystem stability. So mm -hmm. are they yeah. are they you know, uh, are, are they, you know, uh, do they preserve the functions that those ecosystems have? Right. Uh, if I look at a tropical reef, for example, does it have predators? Does it have uh, herbivory? Does it have primary productivity? So we there are now there are actually like globally there are there are uh, monitoring programs that are trying to assess whether those ecosystem functions are being preserved or are those collapsing? Rather than looking at it in terms of single, you know, whether a particular species has gone up or down. So. Um. Yeah, so I wanted to ask what do you think uh, should be the dialogue between conservation groups who are at the forefront of what happens to the most marginalized people in society and ecology and the industry uh, in terms of uh, just how much we consume as a society because I think those issues are closely connected. <coughs> Uh, time up. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's it's true. I mean, I think the one of the problems has been um, has been that we've not we, we've not questioned the the paradigm of uh, you know of economic development, right? Uh, and uh, often when we when I make that statement or when when environmentalists make that statement, uh, the way that it's in interpreted is that oh you guys all want to go back to some gandhian lifestyle i mean I, I think that that's not i mean that that's really a straw man i don't think that's that's what any um that's what most environmentalists that's not what they're saying uh however the you know when for example uh we were fighting the dhamra port in orissa the orissa government had signed uh had signed i think mous uh not tenders but mous for uh, 40 ports along that coast, 400 kilometers, which is a port every 10 kilometers, right? And so the question that, and, and the way that they would say, it, oh, you guys are anti-development, you guys want to, you know, like protect your turtles, but you don't care about the poor people, right? But the fact is, are the poor people dev uh, benefiting from those ports? Who's really benefit? Firstly, is it economically viable? Is that the best way for you to, you know, whatever, develop that coastline? Secondly, who's really benefited from that from from that enterprise um, the one successful port that the one successful protest that stopped the port was actually the uh, posco port in, in central on the central orissa coast and that was really because of farmer protests over land grabbing uh, not by environmentalists uh, so uh, to me that's sort of like a you know it's a reflection that very often the interests of of environmentalists and these communities really align in terms of larger landscape seascape uh, you know use right and use I mean, we want them to use, be used in certain sustainable and, and, and cultural uh, uh, ways that are also economically beneficial I don't think most political and economic decisions are made in that in that climate uh, the Prime Minister wants to develop tourism in the Andamans uh, and the environmental groups that are protesting against it are basically being called anti-development and anti-national of course because if you're anti-development you must be anti-national so if you talk to an environmentalist such as myself, I, I think tur tourism would be great because those communities really need, you know, opportunities. But are those, are those, is that tourism being planned in a way that would benefit the local communities? No, it's being planned in a way that certain high-end resorts can come in and somebody can make big bucks. And sure, they're also entitled to make big bucks, but not in a way that's either an economically beneficial to local communities or in a way that has the least environmental impacts, right? So if you can actually, you know, uh, argue a development paradigm that's both ecologically, uh, environmentally, and socially sensitive. Uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's a, 
win 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 over there uh, which but we're very far from that because uh, that's not how the political economy of the world works all right so coming back on the book right as in essentially uh, at large right so the book really throws up a lot of things on the science of uh, also on the science of you uh, know the biology of sea turtles and how these species are there in india and uh, at large i guess while we digressed a bit i guess on larger conservation issues i think really the key answer to this is the, like we need, need more science into this like particularly like be it the sea turtles or host of things be it frogs or bunch of things and when we say more science we also need more people doing science there i guess with that i will I'll, I'll leave this thought for now and uh, thank you so much thanks for participating and thank you kartik for thank you sudhir and yeah i'd like to thank discussion. ihs for for uh, sure. having us over thank right. you very much thank you so much thank you kartik thank you sudhira for making